right, there we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good? Loud enough so you can't fall asleep? Yeah. You sure? Good. All right. So, I hear you say you're ready to get a flatter stomach. Is that right? Yes. Are you ready to do what it takes to get a flatter stomach, however? Yes. Maybe? Okay, good. So, my name's Yula, like Monica said. I've been teaching this seminar on board cruise ships now for the last five years. This is now my sixth year doing this. I've taught it on Princess, on Carnival, uh, on Celebrity as well. We do it on 140 cruise ships all around the world. And the reason we choose cruise ships is first of all, you have the time to be able to be here. Because sometimes when you're on land, it's very hard to find the time to go to a presentation like this. But second of all is we're on international waters and that means I get to say whatever I want. Amen. So my question today is, would you like me to be honest? Yes. yes. Honest or nice? Which one? Honest. You sure? Good. That's what we're going to do. All right. We're going to help you to get the flatter stomach, but also get that flatter stomach in the right way. And what I mean by the right way is not simply just to lose weight, because what I'm interested in is to get your body healthy. Okay. And I'll give you a reason in a moment as to why, but let me see why you came to the seminar today. How many of you are here because you want to lose weight? To weight loss, okay. How many of you are here because it might not necessarily be weight, but it's kind of like an area. You're happy with what your weight is, but it's like the last little area here doesn't want to seem to change as much. Okay, good. How many of you would like to have more energy? Yeah, if you don't raise your hand, you don't have energy to do so. <laughs> energy is absolutely everything. The more you have, the better you work out, the better that you feel. How many of you, it's a, it's a, a health-related reason? So sometimes, you know, when you have a lot of excess belly fat here, your chances of heart disease are a bit higher, blood pressure can be higher as well, or you might have a big family history of heart disease or cancer or a range of medications, and what you're trying to do is be a bit healthier so that that doesn't affect you, anybody like that? Okay, that's everything that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about health, and here's why. You cannot get a flatter stomach without being completely healthy. And by the end of today, you really understand why that is. It's not just a simple weight loss seminar, because to lose weight is pretty easy. Because I can say to you, I'm going to put you on the treadmill and I'm going to leave you there for five hours. Okay. And then when you get off the treadmill, I am going to give you an apple and then I'm going to put you back on the treadmill for another five hours. And then we'll do that and I'll invite you to stay for another cruise, but that's all you're going to do the whole cruise. You know, would you lose weight at the end of the week? Yes. Absolutely, but would you be any healthier? No. No, and then the minute that we get home, what happens to the weight that you've lost? It just comes back, right? And we know how we gain weight back, it's always with a bit of interest. So there's always a little bit more afterwards than what was before. So that's not what we want to do and that's not what we teach. It's really a health approach to getting your body completely healthy, to not just get a flatter stomach now, but to be able to maintain it and keep it for the rest of your life. So I'm not going to stand in front of you today and say, listen, I'm from Africa and we just recently found a magical fruit on a tree that if you eat this fruit, your hair is going to grow and your vision's going to improve, your skin's going to be clear and your stomach's going to disappear. It's going to require some work. Okay, so we need to make sure that you're willing to do that work because is information power, yes or no? Yes. No. No, it's what you do it with, with that information, right? Because how many of you have seen something on television and it looks amazing? You say, oh, that looks good, I should really start doing that. And then did you start doing it? No. No. Alright, so it's just potential power. So are you going to leave this room today with a flutter stomach? No. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I can guarantee if you apply, you will get it, okay? And that's good. For some of you, uh, one of the reasons is this might be the starting point. You're starting off now because you want to start to be healthier. Some of you are already healthy, but you just haven't achieved the flattest stomach. So we're going to give you the breakdown of what it is that you need to do. There's three simple things. You're going to have to exercise. I'm sure you agree, right? You're going to have to look at your nutrition. I'm sure you agree. And you're going to have to have a clean body, which is called detox, which I'm going to explain to you a little bit later. As I explain to you how the body works, you're going to see how that's relevant. Does that make sense? But then, we have to also be realistic here today. Do all of us have the same style as stomachs? No. no. Do all of us exercise the exact same? No. no. So everybody has this different starting point. Everybody's point A is completely different. So it's very hard for me to stand in front of you today and give everybody an exact plan to move forward and to get a flatter stomach. But what I can do today is give you an understanding of what's happening, what's going on, and what you need to be able to do yourself to be able to get there. At the end of the seminar, I'll be at the back, and I'll give you the opportunity to come and speak to me one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, we only have one day left, so we don't have much time to do that. But I will tell you how you can do that. Does that sound fair? Yes. Good. So you're going to participate with me today? Yes. yes. 
going to keep us all awake and we're going to keep having fun, okay? First thing, what's the most common exercise people do to try and get a flatter stomach? Sit ups and crunches. Do they work, yes or no? No. no. So stop doing them. <laughs> See, you didn't need the seminar. Okay. Sit ups and crunches. The reason they don't work is let me explain to you something about your stomach, okay? Quickly take your hands like this and put them on your abdominals. Yeah, now quickly tense up those abdominals and then press down. So you're going to press down and you'll feel something's hard, right? Okay, what are you feeling? Feeling the abs, the muscle. Can you all feel the muscle? If you don't have abdominals, I can't help you. <laughs> yeah, they're there, right? So when you do a sit up and a crunch, what are you training? That muscle. You're making that muscle underneath stronger, but what is keeping you from seeing that muscle? The fat that's on top of it. Now, just because you train the muscle underneath the fat doesn't necessarily get rid of the fat that's there. Not at all. Because if I came to you and I said to you, I want to lose weight, but I only want to lose weight from my right leg, could I do that? <laughs> but what if I said, I'm going to do exercises just using my right leg. I'm going to use just the right leg to do exercise. Could I lose weight just from the right leg? Impossible. Completely impossible. What if I applied to my arms and said, I just want to lose weight from my right arm, so I'm just going to exercise the right arm. Would I lose weight just from the right arm? No. So if it doesn't apply here and it doesn't apply here, it cannot apply here. So that means when we do a sit up and crunch, we are training the muscle. But if you have a lot of belly fat here, we're not training that muscle very effectively either by doing sit ups and crunches. Because if I came to you and I said, sorry, I had a water bottle with me a moment ago. Ah, there it is. If I came to you and I said to you, let's do a bicep curl, what would be the effective way of doing a bicep curl? From here to here, like that? Or if I said, let's do a bicep curl from here to here, what's the more effective one? The first one, that and down, that and down, because that muscle is contracting and relaxing fully. It's full contraction. That's what's required to work and train a muscle. So when you do a sit up and a crunch like this, and you have a lot of belly fat here, can you possibly bring the knees into the chest all the way? No. So what are you doing? Are you training that muscle properly? No, because you're stopping halfway there. All that happens that we don't even train the muscle, we're just putting a big strain on where? The neck by doing that here. So set up some crunches, unless you have no belly fat and you're trying to get that six pack, that's when it can help you to achieve that. But other than that, nobody else should be doing them. Okay? It doesn't mean that we don't train this area at all, but there is a more effective way to train. And let me show you. So where you are right now, quickly set up nice and tall. Okay. So you sit up nice and tall. Now take your belly button and pull your belly button into your spine a little bit. Okay. Now quickly have a look down. Does the stomach look a little bit smaller? Yeah, there we go. Seminar done. Have a lovely <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for visiting us today. Okay. Now, what are you holding right now like this? Pointing for stomach muscles, but there's more than one. Okay. Let's just call. We'll give it a simple term. This is your core. This is that sheet that covers here. That when you pull your belly button in, it pulls everything back and up. Okay. Now we can do core exercises, but core exercises has nothing to do with sit-ups and crunches. Because when we move, it works the rectus abdominis, which is the muscle here. And look what will happen if we do too many of those. You have to remember that when a muscle gets stronger, the muscle actually contracts, it becomes shorter, right? And I bet you've seen big bodybuilders, big guys that walk around like this, the arms aren't here, the arms are here. Because the muscle is so short. So if we do sit-ups and crunches every single day, what's going to happen to these muscles? Are they going to become shorter? And then remember, it doesn't remove fat because we train this area. So what are we doing to the fat? We're actually pushing it a little bit further out. But if we can make the core stronger, then what do we get? Then we get that here. Then it's a little bit straighter. So core exercises, there's no movement. These are things like your plank exercises, balancing exercises, like me just lifting my leg off of the floor like this, I'm actually working my core because it requires that core not to fall over. That's what's going to make it stronger. So if you're going to do sit-ups and crunches, because it doesn't require this, do you see you're also keeping your back nice and safe? Does that make sense? Now with exercise, what we're meant to do, it's very, very simple actually, three times a week for 30 minutes. Because exercise is only 15% of the overall result that you will see to get a flatter stomach. Isn't that quite small? Now, if I said you only have to do three times a week for 30 minutes, okay, and it's going to give you 15% of getting a flatter stomach, if you decide that you're going to do seven times a week at 90 minutes, 
Is it going to change the percentage? No. no. It's still only 15%. You can exercise more and more and more and more. But it's not the only factor when it comes to getting a flutter stomach. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And that's not a lot of time because if we break that down, right, that's 90 minutes. And this is where I bring in the example. I said it yesterday, but I'm going to say it now. If I do a seminar in front of a thousand people and I say to a thousand people, how many of you want to look good? How many people will say yes? Yeah. Yes, I want to look good. How many of you want to feel good? Yeah. Yes. But then if I say you have to exercise, how many of you will want to do it now? Not you personally, but in general, then the numbers become lower and lower, right? Because we need a motivation reason to do it. We cannot just want it, but we need a reason to want to have to do it. And if you want to, or if you really want to, can you find the time to exercise? Because it's required. And that's what we're saying. Statistically speaking, you have 10,080 minutes in one week. So if you say you don't have time to exercise, I'm going to ask, what the hell are you doing with your time? <laughs> yeah? If you want it bad enough, could you find that time? Yes. Absolutely. And that's a lot. But let's be honest for a moment here. How many of you are currently doing more than that? More than that, you have before, you've done more exercise than that, and still haven't quite gotten the flatter stomach, right? So you see, it's not the only thing. We can go and we can exercise more, but it's not going to help anymore. Does that make sense? The next thing we're going to talk about is a bit of the nutritional aspect. And when I talk about nutrition, I'm not going to say this food gives you a big belly, this one doesn't. We're going to look at why food is so phenomenally different, okay? 10,000 years ago, what were we eating? Vegetables? Protein. Fruit, yeah. Protein, Protein yeah. Nuts. Nuts? Natural. Yeah, it was all natural. Where did we find our food? The wild. The wild forest. We had to hunt for it. We had to gather our own food, right? What were we all drinking? Water. Water. You see, everybody just said water. What did you have last night to drink? Water. Oh, did you really? <laughs> so it's all different things now. Because what we're putting in here, completely different to what it was. But here's the thing, your body has never ever changed, it's never going to change. All of us sitting right here, we all have the same body. Okay? There might be different shapes, different sizes. Some parts of the body might not work as well as others. The actual human body is the exact same. What I mean by that, do we all have a brain? Yeah. Yes. Does all of our brains do the same function? Yes. yes. Do we all have how many hearts? One. One heart. How many kidneys? Two. Two. How many livers? One. One. How many stomachs? One. Except when you come on a cruise. <laughs> it's an extra four. <laughs> it's an extra one. Now, all of the functions of the human body for all of us, does the heart do the same function for all of us? Yes. Absolutely. The liver the same function? The blood the same function? Yes. Some of those components might be a little bit slower, but technically it's all the same. And yesterday, was it the same yesterday? Yes. Is it going to be the same tomorrow? Yes. What about 100 years from now? Is it going to be the same? Most likely. What about 100 years ago? Is it the same? It's the same. The body's functions. I want you to start thinking mechanics. The mechanics of the body is the same. For everybody, man, woman, some parts might be slower, but it's the same. Does that make sense? Now, if you have a car at home, you make a decision before you buy this car, don't you? You say, I'm going to buy a diesel car or I'm going to buy a gas-powered car. Then when you make a decision and you say, I'm going to buy this gas-powered car, what fuel does this car now need? Gas. What's the best fuel for it? Oh, yeah. Gas. Can it run on diesel? Oh, yeah. No. Now, our mechanics need a certain type of fuel. What's the fuel that your mechanics technically need? What type of food? Natural food. Real food. The same thing that it had 10,000 years ago is the same thing that we should put in today. Think about it this way. It's like you have a car at home and you've owned this car for five years and all of a sudden you get home and you've always put gas into this car because that's the fuel that it needs to run effectively. And you get home and all of a sudden you're going to put a drop of diesel into the gas tank. What's going to happen? It's not going to work. It's going to start running slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. So the wrong fuel is coming into the mechanics of that car and that car is going to have problems. So what are we doing to our body? Are we putting in the right to the wrong fuel? The wrong fuel. Because think about what we're eating today. You just said we're eating fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and water. What are we eating today? Everything. And even when we do eat the same foods, have they changed dramatically? 
Yeah. Absolutely, right? We can still eat our fruits and our vegetables, but today those fruits and vegetables, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, viruses, larvicides, a lot of different sides, right? The average apple gets treated about 28 times with all of those before it ends up in your supermarket. And we know what we do when we go shopping with food. What do we buy? The shiny apple. It's the most attractive, but they wax it. And you know what happens when it rains and wax, it just feeds off. So we're taking that in. And I'm sure you can remember when we were buying certain fruits in certain seasons. Today, they're artificially ripened fruit using lead arsenic. That's not good. And if we look at the other element, we were eating protein 10,000 years ago, but today it's dramatically changed. Because to get it back then, I would need to hunt it for me. So I would go have to expend a lot of energy, and I would have one animal like this, and then look at the size of all the people in the room here. Would all of us get a piece of steak this big? You get a small amount. What if I said I'm a terrible hunter? Would you get it every day? No. So we get a small amount, and it'll be a very long time until we get that small amount again. And then here's the difference as well. I don't treat it with hormones, with steroids, and with antibiotics. Okay. Hormones, terrible, especially for men, because chicken is a good example. There's so much estrogen in chicken, and estrogen is women's hormones. When men take in estrogen, what's going to happen? It's going to grow a pair of assets that don't belong, right? <laughs> then steroids make things grow a lot quicker and faster. An average chicken should take four to six months. Today it takes 36 to 48 days. Antibiotics kills bacteria, but it doesn't kill just the bad, it kills the good and the bad bacteria. Bacteria helps you to digest your food. So now your digestion goes lower, with that your energy goes lower, and with that what will happen to your weight? It'll become more. So that's what we're taking into food now, okay? Then think about how dramatically food has changed, especially if you've been trying to lose weight in the past before where we started to realize about, let's say about 10 years ago, the obesity epidemic was higher and higher and higher. More people were putting on more body fat, so the food industry stepped in and said they're going to help give their helping hand. What they did was say, I'm going to make all our food, say, fat free, because that will help people to lose weight. No, because you know when you take fat out of this food, and it's not going to taste great, so we need to find an alternative way to make you still buy that food. So what did we load it full of? Sugar. sugar. sugar, that's right. Now I can stand in front of you today with a 10 pound bag of sugar this big and I can put a label on it that says 100% fat free. Hey, am I being truthful? No. Yeah, 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 because there's no fat in there. But what's going to happen when the sugar hits your body? It's going to turn to fat. So isn't that terribly misleading when you're trying to lose weight? Because now we look at something that says 99% fat free, 90% fat free, 100% fat free, but in actual fact, it's probably worse for you. Okay, and it'll put on body fat as well. So what they did was look at this and says, okay, we're going to help again. So we're going to make all our food say sugar free. Sugar free. What's the problem with that? Artificial. artificial. Now think about this again, artificial, but that's not the fuel that our mechanics need. Your body doesn't know what this is. So now we're putting a little bit more diesel into that gas tank, and we're adding a lot more what into the body? A lot more toxins. And again, I'll explain to you at the end why that has a direct relation with this, and why it's so difficult to lose fat from here. It's like, it's like you hit a brick wall when it comes to the fat here. Now sugar free is obviously bad. These are things that you have in diet sodas, for example. In diet soda it has aspartame. That artificial sweetener, 10% of aspartame is methanol. That turns into formaldehyde in your liver. Okay, it's an embalming fluid, it's a preservative. It stays in there for ages. When you drink one can of diet soda, it takes you at least six to 12 months for your body to break it down. It's an incredibly long time because it has no idea what it is. No idea what it is. It shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's what we put in, and that's not the only thing. You know, you have artificial sweetness that has uh, sucralose. Sucralose. What sucralose is? They use chlorine to purify sucralose. It's the same thing that you find in swimming pools to kill bacteria. And again, so what happens to our digestion? It goes down, lower, 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 slower digestion, and it doesn't work. Okay. Then also, what we have here, we have something that's called calcium silicate. Calcium silicate, you find artificial sweeteners and all these fiber drink mixes. There's so many different things. And calcium silicate is when you buy a handbag or a pair of shoes, 
right? And you open up that box and that little white packet falls on the floor like this. And then you pick it up. And then it tells you in about 10 different languages, what should you not do? Not eat it. Don't eat it, but that's in food. And then we start to look at this, and I don't want to make this seminar just about where toxins come from, because let's face it, can we avoid toxins? No, because I'll have to say stop breathing, because in the air there's smog and secondhand smoke and chemicals in the air conditioning. Stop drinking water, but in water you have chlorine and you have fluoride. Chlorine again kills the bacteria. Fluoride, terrible for your thyroid. It kills the iodine receptors of your thyroid. And then what happens with your thyroid is it doesn't produce T3 and T4, which is the hormone you need to help your metabolism, to help you lose weight. Right? So what happens is that here's where we fundamentally go wrong. Then we go to the doctor because we have an underactive thyroid. But then he writes you what? A prescription. But then when we add medication into the mechanics of the body, it's something that it shouldn't have. Because what's medication? It's a toxin. And the reason we can't avoid it is very, very simple. I'll do an experiment with you and I'll show you what I mean by this. If you know what this is and you know that it's bad, please raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've heard of it before, right? Monosodium glutamate. And pretty much everybody has heard about it. It's an artificial flavorant. So when you buy something like chicken noodles or uh, chicken flavor chips, potato chips, they use MSG to flavor it, to give it that flavor. It's highly, highly, highly addictive. And you know this. Have you ever had a packet of chips and you eat one, and then what happens? You tie it up and put it back in the cupboard, right? No. Now you eat the whole thing. And then what do you want when it's finished? Oh, you want more of it. Okay. That's exactly what MSG does. But now here's the thing. I did a seminar, and this was exactly five years ago. I did it on a ship. I was in Carnival Valley. I did it in a back lounge. 150 people in the seminar. I said, if you know what this is, and you know that it's incredibly addictive and bad for your body, I want you to raise your hand. Out of 150 people, how many people put their hand up? Do you have any idea? Take a guess. Ten. Five. Oh, wow. Eight. Five. Five people. And this is five years ago. And I bet if I had to go back five years ago and ask you what's MSG, you might have gone very well not being as sure as you are today. Does that make sense? Because what's happening, we're becoming more familiar with how bad some of these things are. But now, here's why we cannot avoid toxins, and that's not what the seminar is about. Because recently, I saw in a store, and I bet you've seen this before, chicken noodles like this on a shelf, and big on the label it said this. No MSG added, but it had that little star. What does that mean? It means it has a trace amount. Well, not exactly. The little star will mean, very close, but it will mean Find the opposite and equal little star somewhere on the box and I'll tell you what that statement means. Okay. And then it says, no MSG added other than what naturally occurs in hydrolyzed protein. However, it's not a trace amount because hydrolyzed protein is just another name for the exact same thing. Okay. Now what? We try and make a healthier choice by picking something that doesn't have it, but it has it. Okay. Because now, this is where I mean five years ago, we weren't as familiar, now we're familiar, so what are you now going to avoid? That label, MSG, you can avoid it. But now they changed the name, and it's still in food, so you're still getting it in. And that's exactly what I'm saying. To try and avoid toxins, I would literally say you can't eat anything. <laughs> okay. You can't breathe, and you can't drink any water. We're going to face facts, and we're going to take this in on a daily basis. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I want to start to explain to you what's starting to happen to the body with all of these. It's very, very simple. The first thing is, because of the amount of things that's disrupting our intestinal tract, your colon is going to change a little bit. The average person eats three meals a day, but only has one bowel movement a day. This is considered to be constipation. Okay? Because in a week you have 21 meals and only seven bowel movements. What have you done with the other 14 plates of food? Their, their body, right? They, they, the digestion is so much slower. So if we follow it, you go one, two, three meals in, one meal out, two meals stay behind, one, two, three meals in, one comes out, two stay behind, one, two, three, one, two stay behind, then you come in a cruise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a few more today. I'll give you the benefit, I'll give you two more. But it stays behind. Now imagine if I apply this to this 14 plates of food. If I take 14 plates of food, right, and I put it in a trash bag. And I left it in a trash bag, but then I put a trash bag in the sun. Because in your colon, it's actually 98 degrees. It's very hot. It's dark. It's like a trash bag. Then what will happen with that trash bag full of food at the end of one week? It expands. Yeah, it's going to 
be a perfect breeding ground for infections and bacteria and parasites. Okay? It's not going to smell very great. It's going to rot, it's going to ferment, it's going to decay, and it's going to produce a lot of gas. You know a can of fruit. When a can of fruit goes past the expiry day, what happens to the can? It goes? It swells. So what's going to happen here? It swells. Because your colon can expand to be three and a half times its original size, so it's going to become bigger. And when the colon expands, it can only go one way. Skinny legs, big belly. <laughs> You've seen that before, right? Skinny, skinny, skinny everywhere else, but this is extended here and it's hard. And I'll explain to you later on why it's so hard, but that, unfortunately, that is not purely a problem that sit-ups and crunches can solve. Does that make sense? Because that's why I'm saying exercise is such a small component. But that's where I have to be honest to say, you know, the most common question I've had in my whole career as a personal trainer which now is coming up to about eight years of doing this. And I get this question a minimum of at least five times per day on a slow day. Is what exercise can I do for this? And then I can take the easy way out and I can say, well, we have an abs machine over there. But what's that going to do? Nothing. Because there's so much more going on that I want to provide you with the understanding of how the body works and what's going on really so that we can get to the cause of the problem. Because what you see is just a symptom. It's a symptom of having more body fat that goes away. But the cause is much more deeper than that. Does that make sense? Your colon, when it's healthy, can weigh anywhere from 8 to 12 pounds. But the largest recorded colon in history weighed 60 pounds. Wow. Oh my God. Okay. If you remember John Wayne, John Wayne died of colon cancer. When they did an autopsy on his body, they found 45 pounds of waste in this man's colon. Wow. That's a lot, right? And then what happens here is one thing as well, is that, think about this area just for a moment, okay? This food will impact against the colon wall like this. And it'll actually start to weaken the cells of that wall. And when those cells are weakened, they can expand. Then you create that little polyp or diverticulosis when you get the little parts of the colon like that. Now the problem with this is, is that that polyp sits like this, and it's very hard when food gets in there to move out because it doesn't have the microvilli to move it along. So when the food comes in there, you have a very big risk of obviously infections and inflammation in that area because that rotting and fermenting continues. But this is why this is something that needs great care in changing what you're eating coming into the body. Because what's going to happen is next, this area, the food stays, you're going to start changing the chemical nature of your cells in your body. Okay, and here's what I mean by this. You know you have a trillion cells in your body, and we're all cellular. And all our cells regenerate, okay? So the cells that you have today, most of these cells you will not have in six months from now. You have a new skin, a new layer of skin, every 36 to 30, uh, 28 to 36 days, depending on your age, new layer of skin, okay? And I'm sure you've heard that before, right? You have a new stomach lining every seven days. Right? You have a new liver every six to 12 months. You have a new skeleton every five years. So your cells of your body continuously regenerate. But those cells need to be healthy cells. And cells to be healthy, they need a lot of one thing. They need good nutrients. And they need a lot of oxygen. Okay. To be able to do that. Now, how we measure oxygen is by using a method that's called pH. How many of you have heard of that before? Right? Where you have acid on one side. And what's on the other side? Alkaline, it goes 0, 14, this is positive, this is negative. Now, I'm going to give you a very easy explanation. When something is higher in alkaline, its ability to hold oxygen is good, it's great, it's perfect. So in an alkaline environment, there's oxygen there. That's what we need, and cellular level, that's what we should have. In an acidic environment, there's no oxygen. And if you've ever owned a fish tank before, I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Has anybody had a fish tank before? You know, a fish tank has a pH too. The fish tank should be slightly alkaline because the fish need what? The oxygen. And if the water in the fish tank turns acidic, there's no oxygen. So what happens to the fish? They die. Now let's apply that at a cellular level. All the cells in your body need to be slightly more alkaline because they need oxygen. But when we have an area where this rotting and fermenting, rotting and fermenting continues in that polyp, what do you think it's going to rob? It's going to rob all that oxygen away. And then those cells of that area is going to turn what? Very acidic. And if I had to take all the oxygen out of this room right now, what will happen to you? You'll die. 
So what happens? The cells die. And when those cells in the colon die, you now have a very likely risk of developing cancer. Okay. That's why we want to keep this clean. And this here has been proven in 1935. There's a doctor by the name of Otto Warburg, and he proved that cancer can only exist in the acidic environment. And that's not where our body's meant to be. And I'll give you one guess. What do you think is the number one cause of our body becoming so acidic? Diet. All these things, all these toxins, all these foreign things that we're putting into the body, and your body has no idea what it is. No idea. Okay. doesn't know how to process all of these chemicals. Does that make sense? So when we look at this, don't look so sad. We're going to fix it. <laughs> You'll be fine. These chemicals that your body cannot process go somewhere in the body. And this is what I want to explain to you. Here's how the body works. Very, very simple. Here's your blood. Here's an lymphatic system. Let's put your liver up here.
And the, the fact is a bit of a buffer. It says, well, we're going to send this through to cover up the little lesion in the hole. That's normal. Every single one of us sitting here, this happens on a daily basis. This is normal. <laughs> okay. However, if I put more toxins in, if you drink a lot more coffee, a lot more diet sodas or sodas, or more acidic food, or more toxic food, what is your liver now going to have to produce more of? More LDL. And the reason why is because imagine all those toxic food, how acidic it is. So I throw acid on your hand, what would happen to your hand? It'll burn. So you are starting to create a lot more lesions in the blood. So the liver reacts and produces a lot more. Then what's the problem here? The blockage. Your LDL is too high, but your body is producing LDL to defend you against what? So here's the fundamental problem. <coughs> now we're going to the doctor. But the doctor doesn't ask you, what are you eating? All right. He doesn't look at that. What does he take out? Piece of paper and write you a prescription. But the prescription is for a medication, Lipitor, Simvastatin, Prestor. But what's the problem with medication? It's a toxin. So now we've added something that we know those medications are incredibly bad for the liver. But we've added more toxins into the body. And we haven't taken care of the cause. So now what happens next is your lymphatic system is the next part here. Your lymphatic system is going to start to draw these toxins out of the blood because your lymphatic system acts as your body's drainage system. So wherever the blood goes in the body, the lymphatic system goes with it. They're like hand in hand. They're base, base, base friends like this. So when you put something bad into the blood, the lymphatic system takes it out. That's very normal for us, okay? Very normal. But here's the thing. Now in your lymphatic system, we can flush out these toxins and you can remove them from perspiration and urination, but you need something. You need a good amount of water to flush the lymphatic system. And you also need a good amount of movement. Because without you moving, your lymphatic system can't move. But now how much water should you drink a day? 64. How many glasses? Eight. At least eight. Ten. Yeah, how many of you have heard to drink eight to ten glasses of water? Okay, would you say that they say to drink eight to ten glasses of water? Who are they? Mm -hmm. Have you met them? <laughs> Do you know who they are? No? Do you know how often it happens, and I do this too, as I'm sure you do, when I have consultations with people and I say, well, what are you doing for weight loss? Well, I'm doing cardiovascular training because they say that's the easiest way to lose weight. So who are they? Oh, experts. What experts? Have you met them? Have they met you? Because have a look at something. So would you put up your hand next month? Are we the same age? No. Are we the same height? No. Or do we weigh the same? No. So if those three factors are different, why should we drink the same amount of water? Right? Because if someone is bigger, don't they need more flushing? It's a bigger body. So they require more to flush their bigger body. Just weight-wise, they need more. So you need to take half of your body weight and drink that in ounces per day. That's what your body needs to flush it. Now, does juice count? No, does tea count? What about coffee? Absolutely, Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Because think about what the difference is here. I know some juices and all these things can hydrate you, but it will not flush you. Because when you put a coffee or a tea in, are you also adding in a little bit of a toxin? So it's not pure water that's used to flush the lymphatic system. You need pure, clean water to flush that lymphatic system. Half of your body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, how many ounces of water should you drink? 100. Now, how many of you can honestly say yesterday you didn't drink that water, but you need it? You feel oh, you just didn't get it and you didn't know. What about the day before yesterday? What about the day before yesterday, that day? Yeah? Think about if you've gone a long period of time. A long period could be three or four days. But don't just be short to mind and think about now. Think about 10 years ago. Did you go through a stage in life that you didn't drink that water? Because your body is continuous like this. It doesn't stop and is a new person when you're a teenager. Whatever you did in your teenage years, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, will affect you now. Okay, does that make sense? So if you go a long period and you did not put water in your lymphatic system, which is the number one thing that it needs to flush toxins out, did you also not take any toxins into your body in that period of time? 
So they all came in, but they never came out. Does that make sense? Now what's going to start to happen here is that first of all, your lymphatic system, it's fluid, right? It should be as liquid as this bottle of water. But the lower water it has, it's going to become as thick as cottage cheese. It's a thick liquid that can't move. It sits. But that becomes heavy, and that weighs down on your blood. Now I'll give you one guess. What do you think your circulation does? It slows way down. Way, way down. It becomes heavier. And then every time that you do put a little bit of water in that lymphatic system, your body will now say, listen, I'm going to hold this water because I haven't seen this a long time. So I'm going to put it in there and keep it there. And then the next time you drink a bit of water, I'm going to put it in and keep it there. Now your lymphatic system swells from day to day like this because of course water is not used to it. So you put a lot of water in the lymphatic system. Now it has more than what it should. And we know what gravity does. It takes things which way? <laughs> so what happens to your ankles? They swell and the hands swell. They have fluid retention. This is the exact same thing that happens when you're in an airplane. Think about it, because now you know how the body works. You sit in an airplane, what air are you breathing in? Toxic air for the easy way, right? It's recycled air, so completely clean air. So what happens? Your blood becomes a bit more toxic, so your lymphatic system draws it out, draws it out. So now the lymphatic system is going to hold more fluid. You sit down, gravity goes which way? Down, what happens to the ankles? They swell. Same thing can happen on the ship. We hear this every day, people say to us, oh, it's only on the ship that my ankles well. What food are you eating? I'm not saying anything bad about food. Right. We've got to keep in mind that we need to keep the food for a long time. So it's very much preserved. The amount of preservatives in the food is a lot higher than probably the food you have at home. Does that make sense? Yeah. And are you drinking as much water when you're here? No, it's expensive. Okay. So what happens is the same thing. It slows down. And when you have that, that flows, it slows down. Your nutrients from here can't make its way to the skin properly. So here, the skin can become a lot drier. You're a lot more susceptible to wrinkles even here. Right? That's not what we want. And here is when you bump yourself and you bruise easily. But this is not the end. Because this, if this has happened for a long time, eventually your, your body will start storing toxins in your lymph node. And it stores it in the lymph nodes to make more room in the lymphatic system. Now your lymph nodes are on a couple of different areas of the body. Do you know where they are? Armpits, yes. Neck, yes. Groin, stomach. This big one right here. Now, let me point them out. Lymph nodes are here. They go into here like this, okay? They're underneath the arm, but they go into here, okay? They're in the stomach, but for men and women, they're a bit different in our stomachs. We go for men, for you, they go from here to here. The women go from here to here. How do men gain weight? How do women gain weight? Okay. Then they're in our groin, but look at how they go. They go from the groin here, then they go behind the leg, here into the back of the knee, like this, here. Now, this is what the lymph node does. When the lymphatic system is too busy, it says, well, we need to get some of these toxins out of the lymphatic system so it can keep cleansing the blood and put it in the lymph node. But a lymph node can only get about this big. So imagine it's like me taking a hose. I stick a hose in a swimming pool and I open the tap and I never close it. What's eventually going to happen? It's going to, it's going to overflow. It's going to have to go somewhere else. So your body is going to look at this and say, well, we need to store these toxins somewhere else. Because if we don't, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to get flow full here. You're going to get sick, very sick, because your white blood cells are found in your lymphatic system. That's where it fights off infection. But there's too much going on. Then that gets too full. Then what's going to happen? All those toxins are going to stay in the blood. Then you're going to get incredibly tired. You're going to have all sorts of problems and the blood is too acidic. In fact, you can die from it. Right? So what starts to happen is your body won't allow this to happen. So it helps you. It says, we need to store these toxins somewhere else because they're not being removed. Now, your body will not store these toxins on your heart because you need it. It has a function. It won't store it on the brain. It has a function. The liver has a function. The kidneys have a function. What is the most useless tissue that you have in your whole entire body? It's a fat. Because it doesn't do anything. It has no function. It sits there. That is not responsible for anything to keep you alive or nothing. So it says, well, if we can store sugar in those fat cells for later, maybe we can store toxins in there for later too. So your body starts to store all these toxins in this fat cell. But the only fat cells that get affected by this is the fat cells that are closest to your lymph node area. Which fat cells would that be? The fat that you have here? The fat that you have here, the fat that you have here, and the fat that you have here. Now let's see what happens. 
your body is now going to want to try and defend that fat cell. Again, defense comes in. And your body uses inflammation in every defense situation. Okay? And inflammation is water. Because when you sprain your ankle, what happens to your ankle? It swells. It swells with fluid to keep that area still. And this is a very important word. It immobilizes the area. It keeps you from being able to move the area. So what happens is where these toxins sit on the fat, your body is now going to start to retain fluid around those fat cells to immobilize them. It's like swelling the ankle, the flat cells now swell. There's fluid there to protect them. Now if someone, an individual, has more toxins on their fat, will they have more fluid? Yeah, more protection. Now does water take up space? Yeah, does water waste something? Yeah. So now what's going to happen? is now this area is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger too. And it also, that area can become a lot looser and looser and looser and looser. But we don't just see it here. Where else do we see it as people get older? Here? Here? And even here? Well, I've never in my career ever met a person in my life that has flabby forearms. <laughs> it doesn't happen. This guy's pretty, even if there's a lot of fat here, it's still pretty firm, but then it moves up, 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 till underneath the arm to where you have the fluid, and then what happens? Then it starts to move more and more and more and more, because there's fluid there. Now think about this picture. Now let's try and exercise when we have this going on. You're going to exercise, and your body needs to burn those calories, but it can't get to the calories because it's been immobilized. So you will lose weight because your body needs fuel. So where would you lose weight from? Everywhere where that's not happening. Where's that? The face, chest here, the forearms, and the lower legs. But the stomach, still there. Now if you exercise more, is it going to take care of the problem? No, because the original cause of the problem is still there. And when you start to retain a lot of fluid, it's going to put a lot of pressure in your body. More fluid, more pressure. More fluid in the lymphatic system is going to put more pressure on the blood. What will happen to your blood pressure? Now that's going to go up. So then we go to the doctor and what does he give you? A prescription. More toxins in. Let's just make the problem worse. And now what's happening is because we're treating it wrong, we meet people every day that go from one medication to two medications, from two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six. We keep saying, not getting to what caused the problem in the first place. We're symptom-minded, not cause-minded, all right? And this is why we have a problem now that in the U.S., you know what is the third leading cause of death in the U.S.? Obesity is number seven. Heart disease. Heart disease is number one. Very close, it's medical errors, okay? But highest on the list, it kills an average of 200,000 people each year. It's adverse reaction to prescription medication. Not drug overdose, prescription medication, right medication, right dosage, the right person. I just did not expect that to happen. Isn't that scary? And you know, I mean, you can see the commercials on television. Take this for your headache, but to micro blood clots and stomach goes blind is bleeding dead. Okay? But because we're so symptom minded, did you know that in the US, it consumes 80% of the whole entire world's pharmaceuticals? That is crazy. It said that one in every two people take the prescription, and one in three take more than two. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it's the only country in the world where they advertise medication on television That's like it's fast food. Yeah. I mean, I don't even have arthritis, but the commercial looks so good, so I want to go to my doctor and say, maybe I should try it. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> only place in the world. Okay. Because the, what we're treating is just wrong. We've gone the wrong the wrong way. Does that make sense? Yeah? I and mean, then look at the commercials on television. The one example I'll give you that is absolutely ridiculous is a medication being advertised on television. It, it's an antidepressant. And one of the side effects of taking this antidepressant is suicidal tendencies. How was that? Okay. But to get back to the seminal title, remember?